I'm Carson Hawley. I'm a multifamily broker with SVN Embry Realty. I, I just achieved my CCM designation last year. I'm here to talk with Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Gallegos. I'm also a CCIM, uh, working on the Master of Corporate Real Estate designation, getting a feel for the business from the other side. Uh, I'm one of the lead trainers with the organization and always looking for ways to sharpen our sword here. So why don't we dive on into talking about rent control and all things multifamily. Sounds good. This is the big topic, topic in Oregon right now. Um, we have a major potential change in our marketplace. Senate Bill 608 is a state Senate bill that is pushing through some major rent control. Uh, it would be a 7% per annum rent increase with CPI. Uh, they would publish the CPI increases once a year. And so in Oregon, as you know, we have been totally devoid of any rent control from 1976 up until about 2016, 2017 in the city of Portland, where Portland declared a state of emergency and imposed some short-term rent control issues. They positioned that uh, emergency structure so that there would be a 10% per annum rent increase cap and there would, uh, if you exceeded that cap, you'd have to pay essentially a, uh, a penalty to your tenants. So we're not going to take this statewide. What do you think that is going to do for investors? You know, when you, when you look at this, the details that are on the board right now to discuss are not quite as prohibitive as some of the markets that we're modeling to the south of us. Particularly, you look at cities like Santa Monica, California, Beverly Hills, California, <clears throat> some areas of Los Angeles, California, and you see, you know, they're limited at maybe two to three percent annual increase, and you have tenants that have been in the building for, I mean, you look at some rent rolls and, and you see 20 years plus that a tenant has been in there. And now you know that it's the second and sometimes third generation of that family who's occupying the dwelling unit. And you're talking that, I mean, the current in-place rents are a third, a fourth of what the market could bear if it were rented today, street value. <clears throat> so while... I mean, with nine and a half million people in LA County, it's a different market than what we deal with up here in the Portland area, anywhere in the state of Oregon. But with that influx of, of population growth over the last 10 years, the state and the municipalities feel responsible to do something. When we talk about a couple years in a row of double digit rent increase, you know, low double digit rent increase, mm -hmm. you know, it's pent up demand. Right. That, that's a market fluctuation that as you have the luxury of having a really attractive and popular destination market, which is taking Portland from secondary to primary in, in many factors, uh, you expect that. That's the capitalistic market. So when you, a long time ago, look at apartment investment, people got highly specialized and understood that niche and learned all of the legalities and the rules that they could now play by. And it became a very expensive market to own apartments in. And then it became a very expensive market to try to defend all the litigious, frivolous uh, nonsense. So how soon does that happen? I mean, let's throw that on the table. Well, okay, let, let's just jump to that topic. Uh, how do you invest in a place like that? As an investor, you're going to come in, let's say you don't own units, because I would, I would think the guys who were grandfathered in, they're good. They're golden. They don't have to worry about a new mortgage that's, you know, got huge overhead to it. Right. But if you're getting into a deal for the first time, what do you do? Do you put 50, 60% down? In many cases, you might have to take the idea of positive leverage and chuck that because, you know, that no longer applies. You see most deals that have really, really inferior in-place rents comparative to the market pro forma that gets put in place next to it side by side. And those deals have to be purchased all cash. 
Okay. I mean, there's, there's just no trigger point where a lender would say, yeah, we, we love it. It covers debt enough times. We can come up with a comfortable loan to value. I mean, what's the point of doing a 85% down? Right. It's so all cash. The, but those, those buyers just do it all cash. Why pay the, the points and the costs to get a tiny little loan you know, and, and think that you're going to get your foot in the door that way? Those are just all cash purchases. So, okay, if we, if we take that model where you're going all cash down there and then we move it up here, are we going to start seeing more and more equity as a down payment on deals we do? I mean, the question that kind of leads, or this structure leads to in my mind is that only the guys with a lot of cash are going to be able to do deals. And that means a lot of the mom and pops who get into investing in real estate to build a bigger net worth, to build a retirement, to build long-term wealth, and, and not get rich quick stuff like you see on TV, but long-term wealth, it seems like those guys are kind of going to be priced out of the market. It, it, am I wrong there, or are their mom and pops still doing it in Santa Monica and Venice, I would assume? Yeah, you know, that those markets are a little bit of an anomaly, but if you look at, <clears throat> I think if we hit rewind on, on that market cycle itself, I mean, maybe it's more than one market cycle that we have to hit rewind on, but you know, as you go through it to the late 70s, early 80s, into the 90s, and if you were to look at how many investors are standing in line for a non-rent control asset versus the number of investors that are standing in line willing to bid market price on a rent control apartment building, you have in many cases, a difference, a very different scenario. Okay. You know, and as that rent control market matures, then it, it'll stabilize and you'll get harmony. You know, equilibrium will happen. Okay. Where you'll have enough people who understand the nuances, enough people who have uh, a wallet full of litigious funds, okay. somebody on retainer. But until that happens, I'd hate to be a seller. I'd hate to be a, a seller by necessity, not by choice, in the early stages of the transition from non-rent control to rent control, because you just simply aren't, you're gonna have to be really lucky. Your audience is gonna be too limited. That's my guess. You know, we're rubbing a crystal ball a little bit, but that's, I think that's what we would see if we hit rewind. Sure, okay. So I mean, if we take that model up here, it seems like we're going to be into this position of friction right now and there's probably going to be a big slowing in the marketplace we have seen a lot of transactions over the last three four five years more four than five but uh, we've seen a big crescendo and are we going to go off a cliff or do you think we're going to taper i mean if you're a seller and you're looking at it and you could make or you could sell for five million dollars right and you've been nice to your tenants, and now you say, okay, uh, Mr. Tenant who has a $500 rent, I haven't raised rents on you in 25 years, which is one client I just talked to. Mm -hmm. He was trying to be nice to people. They're gonna push us through at the last minute, and it's gonna be intense for him, because he has to look at, do I lose my retirement and downsize it, just capitalize the in-place income, because I don't want to be a bad person or I don't want to be the bad guy to this tenant and raise them up even slowly to market rate. I just wanted to leave them in there and do a good deed. And now they don't know what to do. Um, it, it seems like that's something that hasn't been thought about very much in the legislation, the way it's been drafted, the way it's been talked about. People talk about all the benefits of having stable rents, which I get it, but it also seems like as a landlord, you can't do that nice thing anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to stay on top of those rent increases for fear that you do have a takeoff. Again, let's say we hit inflation and rents go up 10% again. Again, maybe it seasons for a few years, but how are you supposed to deal with that? I mean, are you just expected to lose the value? How do you mitigate? These are that? questions that really force you to scratch your head if you think about them from the landlord perspective. Well, people look at apartments, especially along the West Coast, as affinity markets where 
you have the luxury of a growing population, usually affluent in terms of the inbound, the in migration coming from another city. Pause there for a second. We think about how many people select Portland. I mean, I'm part of this wave mm -hmm. of residents here. You select Portland because you compare your income potential to your expense requirements, and you think about San Diego, coastal Orange County, <laughs> fun Los Angeles. You think of San Jose, San Francisco. You probably fly right over Sacramento. Wise call. Low dies, no good either. You know, yeah. <laughs> Fresno, no thanks. And you think of Seattle, right? Right, and, and you you draw a daisy chain across all of these markets along the West Coast, and you say where can my living expenses and my you know cost of doing business expenses balanced with my fun ratio of lifestyle be in a in a float where i'd like to be there and portland bubbles to the surface on that list pretty quickly when you think i mean if you just went by the mechanism of grading cost of a single family home mm -hmm. you know at, at 1800 to 2500 square foot starter and just work backwards from there so i get back into the explanation now that we kind of drew that context for the conversation when you think about buying an apartment building in an affinity market where you anticipate population is going to continue to grow and continue to refine mm -hmm. as people flock from those other markets i mean how many universities are there along the west coast Yikes. Yeah. And how many graduates are there every year completing undergrad and grad programs who are now a highly educated workforce who could get highly skilled rather quickly? Mm -hmm. And you would anticipate, I would anticipate, that Portland's on the map as a location for them to move to. Start a family, start a budding career, etc. So for those reasons, Portland looks great on paper. Now you impose a ceiling in terms of ah uh, you can only achieve rents like this as the population continues to spill in here granted it's not growing as fast as it was six years ago right but it's still growing so you impose limitations on the return you're artificially capping the yield of an investment and now that vehicle performs in a way which is stuck in second gear what do you think that does to the audience who wants to buy a property here? <laughs> it's going to dry us up. I mean, the capital that has been flowing into Portland and has been making upgrades to units that have just been run like shanty towns, <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better word, they're going to be skipping over us and moving up to Seattle who may have less restrictive rent control, even though they're a bigger city. Mm -hmm. uh, and they probably have as much of a need as we do for it. The other thing that I was thinking about <laughs> regarding units that are capped out. So let's say that you are a new renter coming in and there's another renter that's under rent control and they've been at the same rent or, or slowly escalating for the last five years. And you come in and you said Santa Monica, they have a 50% you know, delta between what those rent control units rent for it. Say one rents for a thousand, the other one rents for two thousand. I would think when those tenants talk together, there's going to be a little bit of frustration on their part. And that guy in the thousand dollar or gal in the thousand dollar unit, they're going to want to hunker down there as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It might actually work against the goals of getting more quality units out into the marketplace to help tenants. And one of the big things that I always look at is we need each other. Landlords need tenants. Tenants need landlords. We gotta play nice. It's not gonna be a one-sided game. But if we're gonna take a bunch of units off the market by making them artificially cheap, potentially, uh, I don't think that's gonna help tenants. It really looking at it from their side of things. And it's gonna piss us off because, well, as opposed to moving up to 1200 bucks where maybe if we were moving around and flowing like we should be, we don't have an artificially tight supply, right? Right. And that $2,000 unit, it would be a little bit more affordable. Sure. It would be a little bit more normalized across portfolios. And I just, I don't see it working out. I'm, I'm, I hope it does. 
but I'm, I'm really concerned for Oregon. I'm really concerned for our capital formation. I'm concerned for the ability to give housing to people. I'll go tenant perspective from this angle because this, you know, this is a, a card in the deck that doesn't usually get played or discussed until deep into the argument. And let's say that you've got uh, a very well located property that is an attractive unit. It's a nice floor plan and you've got somebody who occupies the unit for quite a while. And now they're, they're in the second or third inning of that game of tenancy where they've been in, they've signed their initial term a year or whatever, and they just stayed there. They're three, four years in. Well, for them to move, their adjustment is going to be abrupt. They're going to go from whatever they were comfortably paying over the last three years with small, limited increases in renewal rate to a mark-to-market uh, -market rate, which is hard to choke down. Sure. They've probably adjusted their lifestyle and their spending habits to whatever their overhead was for housing, for rental housing, and now they really have to adjust and change their spending habits, thus their quality of life, to absorb that increase in rent. Right. That's hard. And then, secondly, if you're a landlord and you have a tenant who's paying one third or half of what the market could bear, how excited are you to make interior improvements to the unit? Not at all. <laughs> Where's the disposable income coming from to keep that unit up to pace with all of the other ones? that are turning over more frequently, or if you had a non-rent control limitation. Well, what if, I mean, here's the thing that I also think about, what if utility cost goes up? Or sure. some of these, cost of labor, what if we have a tight labor pool like we do right now, and the cost of just doing some of these basic maintenance items goes up? There could be a point where landlords become upside down, especially on new purchases, mm -hmm. where they're locked in for older buildings. So, I, I don't know, I, I'm seeing a lot of risk in doing deals now unless you bring the pricing way down. Am I missing something here? That, that's a natural occurrence. The market reaction you would anticipate would be to slow down until the vehicle that you're going to invest in makes sense to you. So that means that all of these financing models and all of these Argus runs and all of these you know, waterfall distribution for partners and placing equity, they now have to be retweaked you got to scrape all the data that you put into your model and you got to develop a new model which is untested so that means that you don't have predictable lap times etc for this thing so now how do you go place money promise investors a return and I'm saying investors because you're having to get capital to buy the property because you can't go to, to a traditional lender at these kind of limited return rates. So when you do that, how do you stand up for a property and be the sponsor for this thing or be the the promote mm -hmm. for a property and, and have four or five people that want a, a preferred return when you don't know how it's going to actually perform? Right. You know, wheels rubber on the ground, going around the track. How does this thing perform every quarter and, and every year? Well, here's another question. Do you think banks are going to change their underwriting? How far can they? Well, I mean, they're debt cover constrained. That's how they're looking at all their stuff. They're also value constrained because they have to get an appraisal on every deal. Even if your cash flow goes through sure. the roof, if your appraisal doesn't come in, we all know that banks are going to reduce our proceeds. That's not going to do any benefit to any owners, even if they're doing very well. Because what I've seen in the appraisals that have come through recently is that even if you're getting rents, they're pulling them back. They're saying your neighbors aren't getting those rents, even if you're an outstanding operator, mm -hmm. even if you have an outstanding product and people are willing to pay up for it. They just say, nope, let's bring you back in with a pack. And that's causing a lot of pain for people who are refinancing. Yeah. We're doing very well. You know, to, to further add, add more salt in that wound, <laughs> if, you, if you look at an apartment building as a structure, right, every time you have a, a turn, you, the owner has a, an opportunity to go in there, 
and essentially give the unit a you know a physical. They get to assess what do I need to improve. Maybe there was a little deferred maintenance over here, or maybe I can upgrade those countertops now, or some appliances would be better. Do I need to address any issues with the flooring? Mm -hmm. They get a chance to go in with the microscope and at least look. Whatever they decide to do, they do, but they at least get a, a look. If you have tenant A, who's been in there for seven years, no turn, how long can something go without a chance to do some preventive maintenance before it just flat out starts to get rusty? Right. And if you're a bank, I mean, if I'm a traditional lender and Carson comes to me and says, I'd really like to invest in this property over here on, on Brand Boulevard and half of the, the tenant roster has been in there for six, seven years. It's got all this wonderful upside. You know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to find a way to write a check to these tenants, which by the way, in Southern California, that's in the teens of thousands of dollars per tenant to get them to move. And you know, that's a runaway train. <laughs> so back to that all cash, really rich, you know, wealthy guy. How sharp is it? How sharp are his teeth? when he's going at tenants. He has a shark. He's got rows of teeth right. coming at him. <laughs> so from that lender's perspective, when do when do they say, you know, we just we're not going to be able to underwrite this property? You know, the amount of infrastructure improvements that you're gonna to have to spend money on are massive because we don't know what kind of boogeymen are lurking under those floorboards in the walls. You know, a tenant how, when was their conditioning event changed last? Right. You know, all, all of these kind of things. So the whole market changes drastically. Well, I think we beat that dead horse quite a bit here. Uh, let's jump topics. Sure. We're talking banks. Let's talk interest rates. At the end of the year, we saw a pretty big stock market decline, a little over 10%. And then we saw interest rates, the 10 year spiked up to 3.3%. It's since come back down to 2.6%. That's a huge drop in interest rates. What do we see in the lending world? Because we know that when bankers get nervous and things get worse, we pay for it. Mm -hmm. And when things get better, we still pay for it. So you pulled out your crystal ball, crystal ball earlier. What do you predict for interest rates and loans for properties going forward? Sure. So if you limit, you know, this one goes back to a function of the income. If you, if we're talking about limited growth, is the lender going to take a smaller spread on their investment so that we continue to see the same quantity of deals, or are lenders going to say we're going to we're going to pass that pricing on to the borrower slash buyer? And I think the answer to that one's pretty obvious. When they do that, what happens to what happens to the normal audience who wants to then complete an acquisition? Well, let's talk about guys who own their properties. How do you prepare for this? Let, let's do the Boy Scout thing. Expect the worst, or expect the best, prepare for the worst. Sure. So how do you recession-proof your properties? How do you get ready for a bank to underwrite with more stringent um, criteria? What are your best practices in your mind? You know, I, I'm going to throw a couple of them out, out the window and replace them with some notes from a conversation I had with a, a very prominent acquisition underwriter who is looking at the entire West Coast. And they're going with a triangulated point of stress tests saying, we need to be able to underwrite and have any investment that we make have the ability to continue to float if we experience a little vacancy so there's a property related issue if there's some fluctuation in the interest rate market which as a, as a short tangent that thing's been up and down it's kind of ping-ponging and it wouldn't surprise me if we go to 3.4 and back down to 2.9 and you know, it, it settles but I, I think the waters that that ball is floating in are a little choppier Mm -hmm. than we've seen in the past couple years. So, vacancy as one point on the triangle. A second point on that triangle is it might be more expensive to borrow money if we have to refi. And then 
we have to look at potentially um, a more global economic more macro related issue that's beyond the building and the borrower and that might be something in terms of his words not mine if it's apartments it's really got to pass a stress test and we're nowhere near rent control we're out and moving to other product type right so that's you know talking about best practices if you own something I would get that stress test manual out and start to say what if then what if then and I'd go through a few of those just to make sure that the property can still cash flow so it seems to me like what you're saying if I can paraphrase you is that we've been in sixth gear cruising down the highway at 105 miles an hour for a long time and we've all been playing a little bit loose with the rules with the speed limit sure so it might be time to get the radar gun out and see if there's any cops that are lasering people maybe drop that bad boy down to fourth gear and get ready for it. So I, I, I do love that perspective. I'm a little bit more boots on the ground. One of the things that I like to do is make sure your structures are good. That's one of the key things for managing buildings. So many people just top down. They forget about roof, you know? Oh, that roof I've been limping it along for years. You shouldn't be limping it along by now. You should have enough equity built up that you're either replacing it by the side or you're just putting a whole new thing on there and making sure that your structure is good manage your your water maintenance systems in Oregon if your downspouts are not moving out the right direction you're gonna have a foundation issue and that is a not cheap to fix so it's going back to the fundamentals in my mind yes you do the macro yes you make sure that you're uh, stress testing your properties on a financial level but you're also stress testing them on a what if stuff breaks level. Yeah. What if stuff is about to break? And making sure that you just have a big reserve pool for that. You should be putting aside aggressive reserves right now if you don't have them. And saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to put this aside for that rainy day. Let's not be the, uh, the grasshopper that plays around. Let's be the industrious ants that are preparing for when winter comes. Because winter is going to come eventually. It, you know, Game of Thrones isn't the only one coming back right now. Sure. Well, I'd, I'd be a, a fan of deploying the reserves so that you're not stuck guarding Winterfell and you might be able to be somewhere a little bit more sunny in terms of a disposition on, on market outlook. So, yes, if, if you're looking at CapEx and OpEx, um, do it a top-down X-ray of the building, if you will, so that you can get a good understanding of not just you know what could go wrong to stress test, but what could we maybe patch up right now to keep us on the racetrack a little bit longer. That makes sense. And you know that could be a small improvement here and there. It could be all that you need to get through all the, all the laps here and maybe position this thing to someone who'd be willing to overpay four or five quarters from now. Right. At least buy yourself the luxury of an option rather than forcing yourself into the position of having to be reactive. Right. And I, I think if you intelligently deploy some of the reserves and that CapEx money that you've modeled, then you know you put yourself in a good position. Gotcha. Well, uh, I think that's enough business for now. What are you working on in your free time? Well, the 15 minutes of free time that we get each day. Um, Allegedly. <laughs> you know, it, that's really been a function of making more time for the free time. So that's starting early, and I'm carving out some time for fitness every day before we make our way into the office. And through the middle of this rainy slash snowy week, I'm planning a vacation to the South Pacific. So time to time to cash in all those miles and reward points and go to Bora Bora and Tahiti and Fiji for a couple weeks. Nice. Sounds like a good trip. Hard to argue with that. No, that's uh, probably the best investment you'll make in a while. Uh, let's see, I got two things going on right now that are kind of interesting. One is I'm headed down to the Daily Journal Corporation's corporate meeting tomorrow, uh, and I'm going to try and meet Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's right hand guy, and uh, you don't get a chance to be around successful investors like that. I think it's going to be in a really small room, there might be a hundred of us. And I know nobody will let me within 100 people of Warren Buffett, so I'll try and get his right-hand guy, Charlie Munger. Uh, at home, 
It's been a lot of time with our girls, and uh, we actually have been watching just a great show, The Marvelous Miss Maisel, on, uh, it's not on Netflix, it's on Amazon. I'm a huge fan of comedy. I love seeing stand-up comedy, and this is like a historical recreation of what it was like when they were coming out and trying to figure out what stand-up comedy it was. It's not knock-knock jokes, it's how do you tell stories, how do you make it fun, mm -hmm. and how are comedians crazy. So if you get a chance, check that out. It's well worth your time. All right. Good stuff, man. I think we, we covered a, 100 miles here really quickly. Um, and as you can see, there's no way to tie a nice, neat ribbon on anything rent control related. There's some very opinionated polarized positions on the subject. I'll anticipate we'll have a revisit of all of these and then some as we move forward here and legislation gets passed to some degree or another. But another day, same time, same channel on rent control version two. Um, March has a trip to Miami, which I'm looking forward to and finishing some MCR courses. All right, well, let's get it done. Until next time. <laughs>